Okay. This is a really important topic right now. Um, it's pretty near and dear to my heart, not just because I'm a, a manager of a, a preparedness wildfire program, but because I myself have been evacuated twice. And I, I feel like having an evacuation go bag is, is a process. Um, I always love learning about uh, other things that I should be preparing for. And um, I have learned some during our practice session. So I'm really excited to introduce you all to Jill Hemingway. She is the Disaster Program Manager with the Northern Nevada American Red Cross. So thanks for attending and welcome, Jill. Thank you. Okay, so I'll go ahead and share my screen. So hi, everybody. Okay, oh, see my daughter, okay. Okay, so we're gonna go ahead and get started and talk about what Be Red Cross Ready is and how you really can prepare yourself, your community, um, your family and everybody around you for potential disasters. Um, and we know that being prepared is um, just a strong part of having that mental readiness for when disasters happen, because we know it's on the if, we know it's a when. And so really important when we're talking um, about Nevada, right, thinking about which disasters happen here locally, um, seeing the poll, knowing some people from California, some people from Oregon, talking about those local disasters and being ready for what might happen in your local communities, um, knowing that they can affect any communities. Um, you know, when we respond out as the Red Cross, we often see that, you know, disasters don't necessarily just happen, you know, Monday through Friday, nine to five, they happen on the weekends, in the middle of the night, on holidays. And so when, you know, we're so vulnerable during those times, really important that we're prepared. Um, knowing that, you know, people can get hurt, um, we can lose our valuable property like cars, homes, knowing that um, cell phones may go down, um, knowing that, you know, the normal things that we are comfortable with may not be available. And so really important that we're talking about this and, and how we prepare. And so when we're talking about Nevada, the vast majority of the communities, you know, talk about, um, you know, earthquakes, which is a common um, disaster that we have in California as well. Um, we talk about flooding here in Nevada. We talk about wildfires um, in different parts of Nevada. We're going to talk about, obviously, extreme heat. Um, and um, here in northern Nevada, we talk about those winter storms that we get. Um, so there's a lot of different disasters that we do face. Um, one of the really important things to focus on is that home fires. So home fires are the number one disaster that happen nationwide. Here in northern Nevada, we respond to disasters of home fires on a daily basis in our local community. While it may not be a large scale event, it's definitely something that impacts people on a regular basis. And so when we think, oh, you know, these like hurricanes are not gonna happen here, these wildfires are not gonna impact me. I know that home fires are going to impact one out of every seven people nationwide. So um, there's a lot of history there and a lot of personal touch there as well. And so when we're talking about being ready, we have to figure out and focus that you have to be self-reliant for a little while. Our emergency responders are going to be helping either putting out the wildfire, rescuing people, um, you know, high level things. And we have to be very um, de independent and be able to um, kind of get out and, and make ourselves safe. Um, making sure that, like, knowing who's in our household, who's staying with us, knowing, um, you know, if you have people with disabilities, people um, who are elderly, um, babies, small children, all of those types of things, really important that we're, we're having these conversations because we know that um, people who are in emergency services may be overwhelmed in the beginning of a disaster. And, and you can prepare and preparing helps everybody and your mental well-being if you've practiced things which we'll talk a little bit more about um, everyone has a little bit more situational awareness and is able to really understand okay 
I can, I can do this. I know what I'm doing. I know how to get out of my house. I know um, how to evacuate, where to evacuate. I know what I need. I have my bag ready. Having all of these things um, really helps you. And being able to adapt quickly in these high um, stress environments. And so this is kind of the mantra of the Red Cross with the Be Red Cross Ready program. We talk about getting a kit, making a plan, being informed. And we'll talk a little bit more about what goes in a kit. We'll talk a little bit more about making a plan and being informed. But I think now is the time for another poll. So um, I'll pass it back to you, Jamie. Okay, so I'm gonna start this poll. Okay, so we're just asking individuals, what top two things would you take if you were to evacuate right now? like a few folks are still voting. I'm going to leave it up a few more seconds. Okay. I'm going to end this poll and share the results. So it looks like a majority of attendees, 67% uh, would bring a cell phone. Um, and then the next highest thing or next uh, widely chosen item is identification. Awesome. So that's actually really good to know. Um, man, mute. It's really good to know. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay, good. So it's really good to know where people are at, knowing um, kind of what uh, we need to have in our kits. A lot of those things that were mentioned are really important. Um, but again, as I had mentioned, right, the cell phone towers could go down. So if we remember about two years ago um, in California with the Paradise um, Fire, um, and they, I mean, literally 30 to 40,000 people were evacuating and cell phone towers went down. Um, and so thinking about, okay, how else would you communicate with people? Because everybody uh, in our culture and, and society are so attached to cell phones. Um, I mean, I know I would have mine as well, but um, we have to think of other forms of communication and practicing um, plans and things like that so that um, we, we understand what would happen. Does anybody, you know, do you know people's cell phone numbers, right? So let's say um, you lost your cell phone do you know the number of your emergency contact and things like that? But really great, um, the identification component, the medication component. So we'll talk a little bit further about what those uh, things look like. Um, so when we talk about our household kit, um, we really want to be prepared for everybody in the home and their needs. We want to have supplies for three days. Um, two weeks is better, obviously, but um, three days is, is a good start. Um, and, and there's a lot of recommendations to have to-go kits, um, not only in your house, but maybe at work, in your car, other places that you frequent. Um, it's a good idea. And making sure you have supplies for each member of your household and then customizing it. So I'm going to get into a little bit more detail of what all these different things look like. So when we talk about like food and water, we're talking about a three-day supply, so one gallon per person per day. So that really depends on how many people you have in your home. Um, we also want to make sure any food that you have is stuff that you can keep in a bag and you're not going to worry about it expiring immediately. Uh, it doesn't, you don't want it to have to be refrigerated and stuff like that. Um, so protein bars, ready to eat stuff, um, crackers, things like that. But you also want to be mindful um, if you're putting stuff in a to-go bag that if it does expire, you want to kind of recycle things in and out. Um, and then tools as well. So utensils, napkins, can opener, things of that nature. Because a lot of people have, you know, like the SpaghettiOs on um, cans, and that's what they uh, plan on using, and then they don't have a can opener. So just being very mindful of, of those things um, 
because when you're in a high stress situation, it is not the time to be throwing things in a bag. Then we talk about emergency gear. So flashlights, batteries, first aid kits, um, and making sure um, that you have maybe a backup charger for your cell phone or you have a radio that gets the, the all the stations that you would need. Some of um, the wind up radios and things like that um, would be a good idea so that you might not have to rely on power if there's power outages. Uh, knowing in Northern Nevada, sometimes we, we get power outages um, just uh, sporadically and if we have wildfires you know they may turn off power so uh, being mindful of that and then the personal items right so a lot of you guys did mention that you guys would would try to pack some medication so know that um, if your medication changes um, or a copy of your prescription these are all really good things to have um, so if you have to go somewhere else and you're evacuating you have proof that that is the medication that you're taking um, clothing shoes and blankets so um, uh, I say in Nevada but obviously in other um, states as well it's a little different when we have summer months versus you know, winter months. So knowing that the clothing that you would put in for the summer is different for the clothing that you would put in the winter. And so that is a, a, a really good catalyst to remind people to maybe change it out on a quarterly basis um, based on the different weather and seasons that we have. And for instance, if you have a small child um, and they're growing, they're probably not going to fit in that newborn clothing in three months. And so making sure to kind of uh, change that out as well sanitary supplies, feminine products, personal hygiene stuff, toilet paper, diapers. Diapers is huge, especially um, for, for parents. The copies of, of the important documents, marriage license, deed, uh, insurance, um, those types of things, identi personal identification so that you might be able to get money out of the bank. Um, copies of your like credit cards um, and putting it you know in a safe or in a safe place um cash um, a lot of us don't carry cash anymore we just have a card but what happens if the atms go down or the credit cards don't work so having you know an allotment of money um, available having that family contact information which we briefly talked about pet supplies um, i will tell you in every disaster that i've been a part of with the red cross people will not leave their animals cats dogs chickens llamas i mean you name it people won't leave them so really important that when we're talking about um taking care of our pets we we have supplies for them so is that a leash is that um, an emergency supply of food for them whatever that might look like you're going to want to make sure that that you have something um, the multi-purpose tools right like if you have to get out of a, a, a location um, and then really important that you have comfort items for yourself. Maybe it's a book. Maybe um, it's, it's pictures. Uh, maybe for a small child, it's something that would make them feel comfortable. Really important, these, uh, these items to, to keep in your kit. And then we kind of transition into kind of like a mini kit for a car. Um, so a lot of us have those like hazard um, things that we can put outside of our car for car breaks down, but really uh, important to have a kit where you'd have bottled water, dried food, like granola bars. So if you get stuck on the pass between California and Nevada, which happens a lot during the winter, you know, you would be good and comfortable um, and having um, the appropriate gear for your car to keep you safe, um, and then being prepared for the different seasons. So whether that be the shovel, the scraper, or the sunscreen and, and items like that, um, it's just recommended that you have um, these kits in different areas because you never know when you would have to evacuate. Um, so we talked about this. Um, um, and then uh, obviously, um, each disaster is going to be different, right? And your needs might be different. Um, knowing where you are locally and being aware of the local disasters and how they might stri uh, strike in those areas, um, you might have additional items you might want to put in those kits. And we talked about making sure you have maybe something at work, something um, in your car, and then things to consider in regards to making a plan. So this is the second step, right? So we talk about, okay, we're gonna make this kit. You kind of know a lot of the items that are highly recommended. The next step is talking about making a plan. So when we make this plan, we're talking about 
practicing it. We're talking about having two ways out of every room when we're talking about a home fire. We're talking about knowing where to meet people outside of our home if, if something happens. We're knowing um, who every uh, member in our family knows um, the contact information if we need an emergency contact or um, everybody in the house um, knows their responsibility. So a small child's responsibility is to get out of the house, right? Whereas maybe mom is focused on getting out maybe a child who has an access and functional needs um, issue or, or barrier. Um, or um, maybe dad is taking care of grandpa and so dad will worry about grandpa getting out. Um, or, you know, somebody will be assigned to make sure you get the dog out. Um, and you practice it. You practice, practice, practice the plan. Um, that the recommendation is that you're doing it monthly. Not everybody does it, but that is the recommendation. So it, it becomes second nature. People understand, especially kids and elderly folks, people with disabilities, they understand it once they've done it multiple times. Um, and like I said, you know, um, when we've had a disaster here locally, like in Reno, uh, we opened an evacuation center um, end of June, and it was for the Poleville fire. And in that particular instance, um, we had to put people up in hotels due to this COVID situation. And we had uh, so many animals go to the livestock event center. And we had people who would not go to a hotel. They slept in their car because of they wanted to be close to their animals. So we know um, that happens. <clears throat> um, and so we're talking about where you're gonna stay, if you're gonna shelter in place, how you're gonna communicate, where you're gonna meet, how to evacuate. Uh, really, really important pieces that we want to make sure that we're um, practicing and that the information is common knowledge. <clears throat> so these are kind of a, a sample kit uh, of what you could create for yourself and your family. Um, maybe even put it on the fridge of, you know, like who's your the emergency contact. Um, potentially memorizing the phone number. I know nowadays a lot of us don't uh, memorize uh, phone numbers, but it is a good plan to know if, if it's mom or dad or whomever's phone number um, and having that on you. So maybe you keep that in your wallet or something like that. Um, in regards to our Safe and Well website, so this is a website um, that the Red Cross puts on or turns on nation, nationwide when we have large scale disasters. So for instance, in Oregon with the wildfires, um, they're um, anticipating mass fatalities happening due to the wildfires. And at this point, we just don't know how many people have been impacted. So the Red Cross has actually turned on this Safe and Well uh, website so that um, people can self-identify um, whether they're in shelters, whether they're staying in a hotel or whatever. And so this website allows people to self-identify um, so that we're not breaching any confidentiality. And then people um, from the community or family members, friends can look and see who is, who is safe. We use this um, website for the Paradise Fire as well. So um, I don't know if everybody remembers, but there were over like 3,000 people in the beginning in early November and when the Red Cross actually was able to turn on this website, um, by the end of that first month, um, it was down to about 80 people who are still missing. So it, it really, really is, is super helpful during large scale disasters. And then the last piece that we talked about in that mantra, right? So make a kit, um, make a plan, be informed. So <clears throat> how do you want to get the information? Um, you know, are you preserving your, um, your cell phone battery because it's at 10% because you didn't know something was going to happen? Um, are, do you have a radio that you can utilize? Um, are you getting weather alerts? Um, are you kind of communicating with your, your neighbors so that um, you kind of know what's going on? Um, and knowing what to do when you're traveling. So if you were going to Louisiana today, um, there's a hurricane coming. Um, and so knowing what is appropriate to do during traveling is, is crucial, especially to areas that are very disaster prone. And then the, the last piece um, of what we talk about is emotional health after disaster. It's, it's tough, right? The, even if you don't lose your home and nothing happens to you personally, being part of a, a disaster is, is stressful. Um, 
and, and being able to take care of your emotional well-being is, is so crucial. And knowing, you know, that, that you can get help and um, you just don't know what kind of things you might see um, or hear about and it may really um, ring true to you or it may go back to some personal experiences that you've had in the past. Because I know we've talked um, or through the first poll that 17% of, of you guys have had to evacuate at some point. And it's a scary feeling. <clears throat> and then we also have to think about the children, right? Or the, the folks with access and functional needs. How, do, how will they um, um, understand or cope with all of these things? Um, even if it's just a warning of something may, may be happening or, um, you know, it's scary. They don't understand um, the ramifications of all these things. And so, you know, we really need to understand um, and help them build that confidence and, and security so that they're more comfortable when these things happen. Because again, right, it's not if, it's, it's when. And um, several times um, locally when we have like home fires, uh, a lot of times we're able to get like all the, all the, the family members get out. Um, I don't know if I should say family members, all of the um, adults and kids get out, but a lot of times some of the animals aren't able to make it out and that could be truly devastating for everybody involved. <clears throat> so we also talk about some tools, right? So we talked about the emergency contact uh, cards. Um, we talked about that safe and well website. We also have some of these free um, uh, apps available on the uh, Google Store or the Apple Store, just depending on which um, that you use, which phone you have. And so you, you will get the emergency alerts. Um, in Reno, you'll get, well, actually, everywhere probably you'll get the smoke, um, the dense smoke warnings and things like that for the, the, the local area in Oregon and in California. Um, but you, these are available to download for free. And then the last thing is um, making this checklist, right? I know what disasters are most likely to happen in my area. Like you're familiar, right? You're getting comfortable with it. You have a disaster plan, right? You're, you're making that plan. You have your kits. Um, the, the recommendation is that we also have at least one person in every family trained in CPR and first aid. Um, it's just a good safety protocol to have in place, especially if you have elderly folks in the home, children in the home, just so that you're, you're safe in case something happens. Okay, well, now uh, I'm open for questions. That's my contact information. Um, thank you guys so much for your time. Thanks, Jill. Okay, let me see if there's any questions. I actually have, oh, let's see. Okay, there are some similar questions. Um, can we get copies of these slides or a pamphlet? Um, and so we are actually going to uh, be providing in a follow-up email, um, it'll go out to all attendees tomorrow, and there will be a, a list of um, items that you should pack in your go bag. Um, Jill, would, would it be okay if, they, if, if people get copies of your slides too? Yes, sure. Um, and so to make this easier, because um, not everybody would like copies of those slides, uh, if you are interested in copies of those slides, why don't you email us at lwf at unr.edu and we will email you that. Okay, so second question. Um, oh, will the slide set be available after the webinar? Yes, it will. Uh, please email us, lwf at unr.edu. Let's see. Somebody had asked, how do I see the previous webinars in this series? Um, so there were, there were two previous webinars. Uh, the first one was with somebody with the Nevada Division of Insurance, and they were talking about uh, wildfire and insurance. And then the second one last week was with somebody with the uh, Washoe County Regional Animal Services, and they talked about large and small animal evacuation. Um, currently, we do have up the um, the... Nevada Division of Insurance webinar. Um, it takes us so long to put it up because we need to m ensure that these are accessible, meaning that they have subtitles at the bottom of the, the screen. Um, so we do have one of those up and um, maybe somebody can share, 
maybe some support folks, maybe Megan can share the, uh, the link to our YouTube and then, they, then folks know where to access that one. Um, we are currently working on the Washoe County Regional Animal Services webinar, making that accessible. Um, so I'd wait maybe a week or two for that. Let me see about other questions. Okay. So Elizabeth asks, where do we get those contact cards? Jill? Yeah, so that is something um, that, that the Red Cross has. Um, so I can send that um, out if you want, uh, Jamie. Um, or something you can probably go on Google and, and type in emergency contact card as well and find it as well. Um, so is it, are those contact cards um, uh, hard for, for people to access on the internet? Or I don't, we would have I, to... I don't think so. I think you could find it. Um, and it's just basic information, right? It's like you could put on an index card the same information as well if, if you want to make your own version, right? And it'd be emergency contact, name, phone number, um, who that person is, and, and, and do that kind of thing as well. We'll, we will try to get those accessible and sent out in that email. Um, I, I don't know if we'll have enough time to make those accessible. So um, it, for, if you would really like one, um, email us at lwf at unr.edu and we'll work at, at making those accessible or, or maybe finding something online. Um, second question, do crank radios work well? Reviews are mixed when I am shopping for one. Um, can we recommend one? Um, I know that uh, because we're with the university, we, we're not supposed to be re recommending, you know, one product or one company over another. Um, uh, I don't know if Jill, are you allowed to recommend any anything over another? Yeah, I mean, so we had a Red Cross store, so you could buy all of these things on, at the Red Cross store. You can even buy like water in a in a bag. <laughs> um, so all these kind of emergency supplies. So, um, if you went to, um, like did a Google search and did uh, red cross store, you would, you'd find it and you could see the items that the red cross recommends. Um, okay. Um, I, I got one, I got a, a crank radio and it was, um, off the internet and it had really high ratings. I think it was like 20 bucks. Um, and I can actually charge in my cell phone to it and um, you know, tune in to a, a radio stations. Um, and I think it's a flashlight too. Um, so I really like it. Uh, let's see, Melody made an, a, really, a really good comment. She said, I have been keeping gas in my car above half a tank recently. I actually thought about that and that's a great thing to mention. Um, I, whenever I'm around emergency responders, they always recommend having your gas tank full. Um, my husband is, is one of those who, who likes to see how far he can go, um, you know, how low his gas tank can go, and it, it drives me nuts, but I always make sure that my gas is full. Um, you know, you don't want to be caught in, in an evacuation and, and you don't have enough gas. Let's see, I think there's some more questions, so let me look. In the event of an emergency, how are we able to help? Is there a way to volunteer? Great question, Amber. Is there a way to volunteer? So, so yes. Um, so the Red Cross is actively recruiting um, volunteers. Um, specifically for the Red Cross is all I can really talk about. But um, we're actively looking for volunteers who are interested in helping with sheltering. Uh, we have availability for deployments nationally in Louisiana, Texas, Oregon, and California for the wildfires and the hurricane responses. So um, you would go to redcross.org and say, hey, I want to be a volunteer, um, if that's the organization that you want to help. Great. Um, Jane has a question. I'm looking at the Red Cross, um, it looks like mobile applications. There's so many apps. Which one do you recommend we download? Um, so there's the one that's the emergency alerts. Um, so that one's pretty good. Uh, there's another one that tells you where shelters are located. Um, 
So I would take it with a grain of salt, um, probably do the um, emergency alert one um, cause it'll, and you can plug it in to where you are locally and you can also put in other sites. So like if you have family in a different state, you could also put in um, that. Just know it's gonna buzz um, anytime th something happens in any of those areas. But um, uh, that's the one, I think it's a, a emergency alert, I think is what it's called. And you know, I would I would actually recommend that folks go to their their local county um, emergency uh, like manager's website and and see if there is a way to sign up for a reverse nine one one in your area. Um, I know we have people from other states, but I'm just going to give an example of Nevada. Um, like in Washoe County, uh, we have code red, um, but that's not the case for all counties in Nevada. So um, you could also look at, you know, what's going on with your emergency managers in your, your local area. Um, I do have another few questions, Jill. Um, so I've actually heard of other states having evacuation levels. There's a level one, level two, level three. Does Nevada have that? Yeah, so um, we have an emergency operations center that's located in Carson City, um, and they have different alert status that they, they put up. Um, I don't know if that's something that general public is commonly aware of. Um, and so, so yes, that, that does exist. Um, and it's just how much staff um, is needed at the emergency operations center in Carson City. So for instance, um, when um, the COVID-19 response was um, happening or when it started, I guess, um, uh, they had to scale up, uh, meaning they had to make sure that there were a lot of people um, at the emergency operations center handling different um, components of the disaster. That's when they also called up the National Guard. Um, so yes, um, there are different levels um, and it's just uh, dependent on how, much, how, ma how many resources are needed. Um, something that is common that maybe most people don't know is that a, a disaster always happens locally, right? It always happens. So if it's in Reno and Washoe County, it always happens first in Reno and um, in Reno and in Washoe, they're going to try to utilize all resources that they have to minimize the impact on, um, on human life and try to make sure people are safe. Um, however, if the scale and scope of that disaster goes beyond what Washoe County resources are, um, for instance, like some of the flooding that we've had in the past or wildfires, then they would call the state. And that's again, when they would level it up um, at the emergency operations center. Does that, hopefully that answers. I, I think the question is more like, so, so the, like in Oregon, um, level one is like, get prepared. Um, it's like ready, set, go, get, get ready. Level two is get set. And then level three is go. Um, and so that's, that's the information that the, the public follows and, and, you know, emergency responders will say, okay, you're, you're in a, a level two evacuation. Um, and, and so does, I, does Nevada have that for people that where, where they actually say to Nevadans, Hey, you know, you, we're level one. Um, um, I don't think in that same scope. No. We just have like a, you we recommend you evacuate. Yeah, so ev when evacuations happen, um, it's basically the fire department saying, hey, you know, you're at risk, you're potentially threatened, get out. Um, the only time when we have mandatory evacuations in the state of Nevada is when the governor says, hey, it's time to get out. Um, but nobody can actually mandatorily make you leave your home. Um, and as far as I know, from what I've seen, I don't know anything in Nevada that has an alert system like that um, in a leveled or tiered process. Um, I know that um, when it's serious, right, they're using like the reverse 911, which is hitting the cell phone towers and, and getting, um, you know, a message on your cell phone and things like that, whether you're registered or not. Um, so they have um, different policies and practices in place. Um, but nothing to the same level that I know of in, from Oregon. So when, um, so I, I you, you, you get, you're so involved in this and I, I love picking um, your brain about this. So let's say that um, there is, a, a, they say that an area has voluntary evacuation. Um, what, what would you recommend to people to do? So, and in, in my opinion, I, I say if there's a voluntary evacuation, um, kind of assess your personal situation um, 
And if you can leave, leave. Um, there, the Red Cross is available in all communities all across the nation and internationally. We set up evacuation centers. Um, specifically in this COVID environment right now, we're putting people up in, in hotels. So to make people comfortable and reduce the spread of COVID-19. And so if you can evacuate, I, I strongly encourage it. You know, when we're talking about wildfires, um, you know, they can't um, put down the retardant to help reduce the spread of the wildfire if people are there. So th that's an issue. Um, or if you're close to it and they always, they can't always predict where wildfires are going. Those are no notice events that happen. Um, when we talk about earthquakes, those aftershocks that can happen. I mean, if you're asked to evacuate, it's, it's uncomfortable. It's not something you want to do. Uh, but if, if you are scared, um, you should evacuate. Um, and, and most folks, and at least in Northern Nevada, do have family, friends, and things like that where they can go. And if it's not an inconvenience, you know, just go. I think that's great advice. Um, what, so you mentioned, um, you know, because, you know, we're, we're dealing with COVID-19 right now, um, what would happen if, um, let's say that a, a region is evacuated and um, they, what, what does the Red Cross do as far as like COVID, do they recommend that folks just have a mask and stay in their car and wait for the Red Cross to talk to them if they're at the evacuation site or, or what, what does the Red Cross recommend? Yeah, so the scale and scope definitely impacts this as well, right? Um, so, and it depends on the county and the jurisdiction and all of those things. But typically speaking, we are asking folks to come to the evacuation centers, um, stay in their vehicles, um, if weather permits and, and all of those kinds of things, like they don't need to be plugged in for oxygen or anything like that. We ask people to stay in their cars that keeps the family unit together. Um, they can stay with their animal like dogs or cats. Um, and then we give them further um, um, information. So we would, you know, touch base with them. We would want to have a bathroom available for people. Um, we also involve the public health department. So depending on where to help do screening. Um, we require anybody coming into a Red Cross managed facility to wear a mask. Um, ask, uh, they're asked uh, the, the COVID screening questions. Um, and I said, take their temperature as well. Um, and then um, once we realize, okay, hey, this evacuation isn't going to um, uh, subside in the next six hours and at six o'clock, we're gonna start putting people up in, in hotels. Um, again, it's going to depend on how big the evacuation is, how many hotel rooms there are, um, and things like that. Uh, luckily, um, in Northern Nevada, we have put people up in hotels. We've had enough hotels, um, so it hasn't been a problem. In other areas like Louisiana, where, I mean, just mass devastation, not enough hotel rooms for the f over 13,000 people that are in shelters right now. Um, there are congregate shelters set up. Congregate shelters are like a gymnasium and a school, a rec center, but know that there's a lot of um, screening happening. Um, there's isolation folks, uh, isolation rooms for people who may be COVID positive or suspect. Um, and um, there's a lot less people in those. So there's a lot more shelters available. Um, we are, we're there. Um, if someone has COVID, we're not going to turn them down. We're going to figure out a way to continue to, to support them um, on their road to recovery. Um, but we also don't want to spread it either. That's really interesting. I was wondering about that. Um, I, it, it doesn't look like there's any more questions from um, the public, but I have one more question. So mm -hmm. where is there more information on how to help children cope? Yeah, um, so I don't know um, an exact place to direct you. Um, I would have to do some more research. Um, and I, I think that's a very uh, good topic um, to talk about, right? Like how do children cope with disasters and how do we help prepare them for disasters? Um, we, um, as the Red Cross, do have some preparedness programs that are focused specifically on, on kids. So we have um, a program called Prepare with Pedro which is focused on kindergarten, first and second graders. Um, so it teaches for those age ranges. Um, and then we have another program called um, the Pillowcase uh, Project, which focuses on um, third, fourth and fifth graders. Um, 
And those programs specifically talk about um, local disasters. So they might talk about earthquakes and home fires. Um, it goes over um, some coping skills to teach kids. And then we also talk about what evacuations look like, the to-go bags, but more centric on the kid. Um, and so we do offer those presentations. All, all presentations from the Red Cross are completely free. Um, and we just want to get the information out there in the community. And so do you guys do Zooms um, or, or any sort of online format for, for those presentations? We do. We, right now, yeah. So right now those presentations are completely virtual. Um, and so we're looking for opportunities to, to get into classes or to get into different um, venues to be able to present these um, this really vital information, knowing that um, COVID is not going to stop disasters. So, mm -hmm. Great. Um, okay, so I don't see any more questions. I'm actually going to um, dive into the post-workshop polls. And if any of you have any questions, um, feel free to type it in. And, and we still have Jill on here, so we can answer that. Okay, so I'm going to launch these post-workshop polls. Um, these post-workshop polls are anonymous. We will not be sharing any of this information. Um, and it's really greatly appreciated if you can help fill this out and help us understand uh, whether this was helpful, what you learned. Hey, Danny, while people are polling, can I pick Jill's brain? I have a quick question. Yeah. <laughs> this, sure. is Megan. this is Megan. I'm the outreach coordinator for Living with Fire. I've been answering some of you guys' questions in the Q&A box. Is there an item that you, or and maybe Jamie, since you've been evacuated, you can answer this as well, like an underrated item in a go bag that is just like so useful that people don't think about? That's a good question. Um, so I, I go back to like the comfort stuff. So like if you have like a comfort food that is something <laughs> or a comfort item, um, uh, that would be something that um, I would say is really um, important. Maybe it's like a family photo um, or something irreplaceable to you. Uh, maybe it's a blanket that was sewn by your grandmother or something. Um, that would be something that I think um, people might really want to have. Um, so they don't forget it. Yeah, I agree. Um, you don't really think about like pictures. Um, I, um, after the first time I was evacuated, I ended up um, saving all of like, you know, my, my, my wedding photos on a, a thumb drive. And that's in my, my go bag right now. Um, if, you know, I was lucky enough during that, during actually both evacuations that both of my um, homes were unscathed. But, um, you know, if, if I would have lost those things, I wouldn't have anything to remember. Mm. I was reading before this, I was doing some research online and some people were talking about like trash bags. And I thought that was very interesting, like because they're multifunctional, like you can put extra stuff in them. It could be kind of rain ponchos, things like that. So yeah, it's really, it's really interesting. But yeah, as far as the, the memorabilia, yeah, that's definitely something to consider because those things are irreplaceable. Our, uh, let's see, Christina, our boss, she just texted me, sound machine for kids. That could be like a comfort thing if you have an infant. For sure. For drown sure. Out, drown out all the stressful noises happening. For sure. Well, um, I don't see, are there any more questions? Let's mm -hmm. see. 
it looks like everybody's done with this polling. We're going to end with the poll. Um, well, um, you know, I would just love to say thank you to Jill for attending. Um, this is always educational. I always find something new to, to put in my go bag. Um, thank you for taking the time to get this presentation together and to work with us prior to this. Um, Thank you to all attendees for attending this. Um, I, I really hope that this helped you and with your preparation. And um, if you still have any other questions, you can always email us at lwf at unr.edu. Um, I'm just going to put a plug in for next week's um, presentation. So Megan and myself will be doing a presentation on um, five ways to create effective defensible space. And then the Tuesday after that, the, the Tuesday, the last Tuesday of the month, uh, Christina Rostano, the director of Living a Fire, she's going to be talking about um, retrofitting your home. So ensuring that your home has uh, proper construction to reduce the threat of wildfire. Um, again, if you have any questions, email us, lwf at unr.edu, and thanks for attending. Before we sign off, I do just want to point out some people have left some uh, great recommendations in the chat. So before you sign out, go ahead and take a look at those two. And I will stick on here just in case anybody has any questions. Amy, do you need anything else from me? No, thanks, Jill. Okay. Appreciate it. Awesome. Okay, bye, everybody. Thank you, Jill. Yeah, we've got some great recommendations here. It looks it looks like we most of our audience has signed off though. So great. If it's okay with you, do you want to go ahead and sign off, or should we stick around for a few more minutes? Um, somebody talked about. I would like to know how to open a garage door if electricity goes down. Thanks. Um, mm -hmm. uh, Whoever wrote that question, why don't you email us, lwf at unr.edu. Um, I, I, I know that, um, that there are ways to manually lift open your garage door. Um, there are videos um, on, on YouTube on how to do it. Sometimes folks aren't physically able to open up their garage door. And so um, you can actually get a battery powered um, garage door opener to, to help with that. Um, you know, sometimes there's like wooden garage doors that are incredibly heavy. But um, if we didn't answer your question, you can always email us, lwf at unr.edu. And I think that's it. Well, thank you, everybody. Okay, sounds good. I'm going to go ahead and sign off. See you guys next Tuesday, hopefully. <laughs>